The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello, and welcome to the Healthcare Facilities Network slash High Reliability Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Martin, the president of Goslin Martin Associates, and we will uh, simulcast this episode on both our High Reliability Podcast Network and our YouTube Healthcare Facilities Network. If you're listening to this on the High Reliability Podcast, I would encourage you to seek out the Healthcare Facilities Network on YouTube. It is a channel we created uh, earlier this year in March that is dedicated specifically to the discipline of healthcare facilities management, telling the stories of folks in healthcare facilities management in an effort to fill the pipeline to get more people into this discipline of healthcare facilities management. So thank you for clicking on, as always. Today is our third, yeah, our third um, ASHI recap show. The American Society of Healthcare Engineering uh, annual conference was held August 6th through the 9th. It was held in very hot San Antonio. Uh, temperature daily was like 104 to 106 degrees. So it was extremely hot, but uh, nice city. Had a good time down there. Um, the river walk is very nice. If you get out early enough in the morning, the temperature's not over 100 yet. So um, it was a good time. And so as we've done for the past three years, just wanted to recap the show a little bit. And for me, um, you know, in addition to having a booth and meeting, you know, many of you, um, which is really one of the benefits to going to the ASHI annual um, is to just meet the folks that we speak with throughout the year. So if you did come to our booth, if we had an opportunity to speak, uh, Thank you for doing so. I appreciate that. It is great to uh, it is great to meet so many people who work in this most noble of uh, professions. So the um, one of the pieces of news, and it's not really hugely important in your day to day, but uh, Ashi is renaming the Ashi Annual, which they've had for sixty years, and they are calling it next year, beginning next year, out in Anaheim when the conference is held in July. They're calling it the Healthcare Facilities Innovation Conference. So a pretty dramatic, dramatic change from ASHI Annual to the Healthcare Facilities Innovation Conference. Um, don't necessarily mind the name. Uh, we'll see how what people think about it. After 60 years, you get great name recognition with the ASHI Annual. So I'm sure that um, you know it's always difficult to change, but where's the industry going? It's going towards innovation. So certainly the name... Um, is accurate. So that's that was some some big news coming out of the annual. Um, there were two things that I wanted to comment on relative to the annual. Now, firstly, um, you can't really get better technical training anywhere, and and the sessions were, you know, were fantastic. We had a booth this year, so we were on the um, we were on the ashy floor, but also try to get to as many of the sessions as possible um, because it's always you know you always want to keep. You always want to keep learning. You always want to keep hearing what's going on out in the field. And as is often the case, you can't get to everything that you want to go to um, because sometimes there's multiple multiple sessions going on at one time. But there were two sessions that stood out for me that I wanted to um, comment on. The first, and it's not one of the two, but the opening session was with a gentleman by the name of Anthony Trucks, high energy Um I really enjoyed his presentation. He is a former um, NFL football player. He was a college player at Oregon. He appeared on um, American Ninja Warrior, which I actually like American Ninja Warrior. I don't know if that's uh, if I should admit that out loud, but I watched that with my kids uh, and they enjoy it too. So he was on American Ninja Warrior years ago if you haven't seen ninja warrior it's on nbc i don't watch a lot of tv um but that is one thing that i like to watch during the summertime because uh, it's usually coming on when the sun is down but he also has a pretty interesting anthony trucks has a pretty interesting life story as well from um being adopted uh, he had a really good story about overcoming adversity and keeping on and one of his uh one of his trademarks trademarks excuse me trademarks a little accent coming out there um one of his trademark phrases that he had the audience say often was shift happens shift happens so he added the f but a really good presentation he's got some books he's got a website anthonytrucks.com so uh, i enjoyed that i thought it was a really good session 
I also picked up a little bit of a cold down in San Antonio. So if occasionally my voice goes to a uh, Bobby Brady or Peter Brady, I can't remember. Maybe it was Peter Brady. Was that the episode where he was singing on the Brady Bunch and his voice would uh, his voice would change on him? So I did pick that up in San Antonio. Two sessions though, I did want to comment. One, it, it was on decarbonization. It was called Operation Decarbonization. It was on the first day. And uh, there were three presenters for that, Andy Mumvoya and Andy. And I actually did a decarbonization show on our healthcare facilities network. So if you haven't watched that, it's two episodes. But Andy was one of the presenters, as was Kara Brooks, as was uh, Kathleen Fink. And so it was a good, good session. You know, I, I counted the... Um, the number of sessions at ASHI. And this year, there were 20 sessions on compliance. There were nine on sustainability and energy management. And certainly, decarbonization falls into the sustainability emergency management. Within the compliance section, though, where there were 20 classes, two of those compliance sessions were focused on energy management and sustainability. So it could almost be like 18 to 11 Six of the classes were on healthcare project management, and then another five were on administration and finance, assessing risks, maintenance and operations. So you can see coming in at 11 or nine classes with sustainability or energy management, it was certainly a focus. And you really can't get away from decarbonization in healthcare facilities management. Um, you know, healthcare is responsible for eight and a half percent of emissions here in the United States. And so it is certainly going to be a hot topic. But one of the things, and, and I hope this isn't picky Yoon on my part, um, decarbonization, you know, if you listen to the, the telecast we did with Andy, or really if you do any reading on it, you know that um, it's also a political issue. Unfortunately, you can't go anywhere without getting away from politics or getting involved in politics these days. But I thought one of the words, um, and I'm a word person, right? I do presentations, but you know, I also have a, my degree was in journalism and history. And so I, I words matter, I believe. And this is where I go to the picky and I hope I'm not being picky. Un, but on one of the opening slides, there was a, and I wanted to show a picture of this slide, but I am a horrible picture taker. So I actually took a picture of the slide because the word that was used really stuck out to me. I was like, oh boy, you know, like sometimes you see a word and it's like a punch in the face because it stands out to you. So I took a picture of this slide Unfortunately, I missed half the slide, so I'm not going to show it to you, but you'll have to trust me. This word was on here. Within my family, I take the pictures, but I am a volume picture taker, meaning I click, 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 click. I take many pictures because I figure if I take many pictures, then at least a couple of them will come out well. And so I'm a volume picture taker. I wasn't a volume picture taker at the ASHI annual, which is why I only took one picture of the slide and it really didn't come out well. But the way they were talking about the different constituencies, and it was a it was a beginner level class. Um, but they were talking about the different constituencies that exist within hospitals, and you have the folks who are kind of on the team. But then they use the word opponent to describe anybody who wasn't fully on board the decarbonization, which I thought was interesting, because um, to me, and I actually, you know, when I saw the word. It, I kind of stopped listening for a bit because I was focused on it. To me, an opponent is somebody that I'm fighting or somebody that I want to defeat or it's a person or it's a group. When I come in, there's a natural adversarial relationship that exists. So I thought using that word within this context, because it was a well attended, it was a well attended session. Um, and it was an informative session outside of that. They conducted a, a they conducted a poll at the very beginning, which I thought went on a little bit long, but there were a lot of people in that crowd. And you know that some of the people in that crowd um, relative to decarbonization are probably not the hugest fans or the biggest fans. We talked about this in my um, facilities network show with Andy Wumavoya. Andy talked about a person who was in his crowd and came up to him at the end asking him if he really believed in decarbonization. And so I just thought the word opponent was wrongly used. And I, I, I hope that um, I hope that people who aren't fully on board, because you can, you know, you can agree 
that it is an issue that decarbonization is necessary. But you can also think that, okay, maybe there's other ways to go about this, to solve this problem. I mean, if you look at it by 2030, um, one of the goals of the United States is to cut greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2030. And so that is quite the goal. So you can be on board for cutting, but maybe you look at it in a little different view. And maybe you think, you know, some of the steam trap work that you've done or some of the LED replacement work you've done should count towards some of that, um, those goals. And so, again, I think words mean things. Um, and to me, opponent was just a misuse. Now, you know, I talk about the word opponent, yet we also have, you know, Chad Beebe, um, you know, was talking about the, the, um, the decarbonization. And, you know, Chad says, and this is the ashy point of view, we believe it's an organizational choice to determine appropriate methods and targets for sustainability. Regardless, states are imposing targets that are unrealistic for even the best performing hospitals. So um, it's good to, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sure most facility directors or facilities professionals or planning design construction professionals, you probably like to hear those words. But again, I just thought the word opponent was a little bit curious because it conveys a natural fight right at the um right at the very beginning and as i said i think that reasonable people can agree that greenhouse gases and that emissions need to be cut but reasonable people can also want to go about it in different ways i mean if we all think the same way and, and if we're all going in the same direction all the time that's when issues develop so that was the first thing Again, I apologize if it's picune, but you know I do presentations and I do writing, and I'm sure most of you who do it, you think about the words you use. So when I've done presentations in the past, if I were to put opponent on there, I would have thought about the word and I would have said, yes, that is what I want to convey. I thought that was interesting given that audience there. And it was well attended, which is a good thing. So that was the first comment I wanted to make. Um, the second was on day two. There was a morning session. It was called healthcare workforce uh, staffing solutions, which I was really happy to sit in on given, you know, what we do at Gosselin Martin Associates here in the um, recruiting arm and also what we're trying to do here with the Healthcare Facilities Network. Uh, Chad Beebe, again, from ASHI, he was the moderator for that. Jim Prister, um, president of RLM Specialty Hospital uh, in Naperville, Illinois. So Jim was on the... Um, was on that panel. Jim is also on the AHA Workforce Task Force. So the AHA, the American Hospital Association, the parent company uh, of the American Society of Healthcare Engineering, they have a workforce task force to tackle this issue. So Jim is not a facilities person, but he's on that task force. There was also supposed to be two other people um, on that board who, on that panel, who did not appear one had a, a, a conflict that they couldn't make it. And the other one, interestingly enough, took a new job. So they weren't able to make it. So there were supposed to be two other folks on that board um, who weren't able to make it. I thought it was, to me, that particular session, I thought fell short of what it could have been. Um, again, I don't mean this as criticism. It probably comes across that way. But I didn't think that, you know, Jim had the, bigger picture perspective, the AHA. From my standpoint, it wasn't focused enough on the people who were sitting in that crowd. Now, maybe it would have been had those other two folks been able to attend. I went to look for the, um, I went to look for the uh, conference um, syllabus, the conference agenda, but I couldn't find it today. And I think it was removed when Ashy removed ASHI annual and put up the promo for the Healthcare Facilities Innovation Conference, which again is next July in Anaheim, California. I think they took down the agenda for this particular um, this particular class. So I wanted to see who else was supposed to be on there. But I did think it, it, it fell short. I thought it was um, focused a lot on clinical areas. Um, Jim did say that 30% of the clinical workforce, nurses from COVID uh, have retired and it's going to take five years to, to replace them. But I thought that, um, 
I thought that I know that people sitting in that crowd, and I actually talked to some folks afterwards to get their impressions, because I can be biased. I mean, I would absolutely admit that, that there's probably a bias on me. And if I'm sitting there in that crowd, given what we do and who I talk to on a daily basis, if we're focused on clinicians or if we're talking, you know, they, they talked about um, creating 10, 20 year, 30 year plans down the road, which is all well and good, but it's like the issue is here today. I can't find people today. I'm not even worried about five years, 10 years. What are you going to do for me today? So I can be biased. I understand that. And I know that. Um, so I did ask some other people what they, you know, what their impressions were, because I want to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm fair. You got to be fair to everybody. But um, I think many people did say, in fact, the person I was sitting next to said to me um, while we were there, you know, this isn't focused on on what we're doing and the challenges that we have. And so I thought that um, this is a huge issue. I think it's good. It's good. I think it's um, important that AHA is focused on it. I would just like to see, and, and Jim admitted, and again, I think this is, you know, he did a good job. He also admitted that um, the AHA, you know, they're, they're not as, I'm trying to look for it. I'm, I'm one of those people who still writes everything down. Um, but he said something to the effect that um, <clears throat> they don't, you know, the healthcare facilities area isn't always as focused on as it should be. Um, and again, he wasn't saying that in a um, negative way. It was just kind of a matter of fact. So they talked about in the presentation just, you know, how community, ho oh, community hospitals, how community colleges um, don't always have classes. I think he said maybe there's one community college in America that has it. But again, I think this is where a little bit of the disconnect happens because there are some community colleges out there that are doing work in healthcare facilities management and have classes in healthcare facilities management. Obviously, Mike Canales uh, at Owensboro Community Technical College is probably the most well-known, but there are other folks out there putting programs in place. And so I thought, you know, when he, when you say that there's not a lot and there's only one. Well, factually, that's not true. So I think that you would like to see, and, and you know, AHA is a huge organization, understood. But let's make some more connections downstream to the folks who are actually doing some of the work out there because everybody, you know, why did we form this healthcare facilities network? Well, we formed it because we realized there's an issue with people coming into the field. So we want to promote it we felt that we could do a little bit more. And there's lots of folks out there doing different things. So let's connect, you know, let's connect through ASHI. Let's connect through AHA. Let's all work together because it impacts all of us at the end of the day. And so I thought that there was a little bit of an opportunity that was missed there with that particular session. Now, maybe that opportunity wouldn't have been lost if two of the folks who were supposed to be on that panel had been able to make it. Again, they couldn't make it. It was out of their own... Um, it was out of their uh, power to do so. The other thing at the very end of that presentation, there was a question that was asked. I, and the person asked, um, they talked about education and they said that, you know, some of the requirements of organizations, they're so stringent relative to the need for education that they can't utilize people who have experience because organizations are increasingly um, requiring the degree. Now, we've talked about that. I've done a number of podcasts, high reliability podcasts about education on the Healthcare Facilities Network because I'm a history nerd and I do love history. And uh, we did a, a class um, that you can find on the Healthcare Facilities Network. It is titled Abe Lincoln, Not Qualified to Run a Facilities Department. So you might think that's a little crazy. He wouldn't have been running a facilities department in 1865 or 1861 to 1865 or really throughout his career. But anyway, um, we talk about that. And I think that I had hoped Jim couldn't really dive into that issue or that answer because it was right at the very end. But we've talked about it before. You know, the 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 need for education um, is only increasing. You know, my son is talking about you know, dad, I don't necessarily want to go to college. I want to go into wants to maybe be an electrician. You know, I want to go into the trades. And so I'm talking to him about that now, what it means, what it doesn't mean and what I do at work and, and conversing with him about, you know, the impact of that. And I think there's lots of kids like him. He doesn't want to go to school anymore and he could, but he doesn't want to. So there are kids like that out there. And I say kids, my son is younger. Um, 
maybe they go the trades path, but does that bite them? And then, you know, you know where, when they're 10 years down there into their career. And that's one of the things I'm talking to him about. Cause I said, that's great. Go it. I mean, we need electricians, you know, you need electricians in hospitals, but are they going to hold it against you 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road? So that's what we're, you know, I'm talking with him through that now. So I thought the education was a good one. The other, other thing too, on the healthcare facilities network, we did a show um, and I got some feedback from it on the ashy floor. And I was, I was happy to hear that people liked it. We did a, a session called career paths into healthcare facilities management. And I looked at some of the resumes that we have here to see, you know, what are those career paths look like into healthcare facilities management? And that was an interesting, because you can see where people start and where they end up. And you can see that there's a variety of ways into this field. And these are actual ways that people have found themselves into the field. So I would encourage you to go look at those two things, career paths into healthcare facilities management. And I'm actually working on another one now. I'm going to try to do one of those monthly because I think that people like to see how other folks get into their roles. And since these are real career paths, not made up, obviously we don't use the names of people, but um, it's interesting. It's interesting to see. So I thought that was a, it was a good and timely session. I thought it fell a little bit short because it wasn't focused entirely on the needs of the people who were sitting there in the crowd. What are you going to do for me now? And that's what people are in it for. And I'm, you know, I think that we as a society tend to be, you know, we want immediacy. And I think that we've gone a little bit too far. You want an answer like everything needs to be immediate, but relative to this issue with, um, the lack of people, this one does need to be immediate. We can't have another task. I mean, task forces are great, but so let's have a task force, but then let's also operate in the immediate, the immediate time frame because I need help now. I think that, you know, we, if we look at, you know, I talked about the decarbonization, operation decarbonization with, um, you know, those, those demands that are coming down the road for 2030. So if we look at that and then we look at the workforce, I think, you know, two things come out of that. We're going to see more people potentially who just say they're both out of facilities management because they might not have the money, they might not have the time, they might not have the personnel to be able to do everything they need to be able to do. So I think we see that from staffing and from some of the sustainability uh, demands that are coming. Now, there are assistance, assistance, there are um, programs out there to help with the sustainability and with the decarbonization. So that there's people are definitely trying to provide answers and solutions and help. But that doesn't always help the person who's in the director of FM seat when they have all of these other issues that they're dealing with. And that's what concerns me. What is that breaking point? The only other... Uh, class that I wanted to comment on and, and talk about love history, also love weather, but there was a session that Men Excel gave uh, and it was titled um, Five Years of Disasters in 18 Hours. And it looked at the, um, it looked at the Arctic outbreak in Texas, the Arctic outbreak accompanied by snow in Texas two years ago, uh, February of 2021. And that was very informative. The, the Men Excel uh, presentation was a good one uh, about how they view emergency management also as an opportunity um, to gain some revenues. And, and I had to leave that one a little bit early because I had to get our booth set up for the conference floor. But that is a session I, I want to reach out to the folks at MedExcel and see if we can talk about that because I thought it was an interesting perspective. You know, they were they stayed open, their hospitals stayed open when many others closed um, through that whole uh, through that whole ordeal. And so, just hearing how they look at that as an opportunity, um, as opposed to uh, looking at it as okay, we got to close the doors. I thought that was an interesting approach. The only other thing I'd want to say is congratulations to Dave Dejanay who won the Crystal Eagle Award. New England's own, New Hampshire's own, um, Dave Dejeuner. So overall, I really enjoyed, as always, the ASHI Annual Conference. Um, those two classes, they, those two classes that I commented on, the, that to me was, you know, that did stand out, but they always do a wonderful job and it's a great opportunity to connect. I'm still one of those people who, um, I love the face-to-face -face component. You know, I love the the interaction where you see people and where you connect with people. Obviously, I think we've lost a little bit of that 
with COVID and post COVID. So hopefully it continues and the networking continues because we can do it like this over YouTube and you can do it over conference calls, but there's nothing that replaces face-to-face -face communication, face-to-face -face interaction. And so with that, I am going to sign off via YouTube or podcast where we're not face-to-face, -face, but I appreciate you listening or watching. And if you haven't subscribed to the Healthcare Facilities Network, please do so. As always, thank you for watching. Have a great day. And we will be back with a future episode. Take care. Thank you for watching this episode of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Please give this episode a like, as it really does make a difference in helping to promote the discipline of healthcare facilities management.